quiet on set, please. Sex positive culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is Horizontal with Lila. Welcome to Horizontal, the podcast of intimacies recorded while the opposite of vertical. It's slow radio. We're wearing robes, lying down, and sharing secrets in your ears. Usually our conversation is long, sensual, and languorous, lasting between two and three hours. And when I release it as Horizontal with Lila, I divide it into two parts. The first half is available in all the podcast places and the second is available exclusively to my patrons of the Horizontal Arts. You can become a patron for access to the full Horizontal, plus a monthly video of intimacy tips by signing up on patreon.com slash horizontalwithlila. That's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash horizontalwithlila. My episodes always conclude like this. At the end of each conversation, I ask my guest to tell me a story. It can be any story under the broad umbrella of intimacy. In other words, a tale that is related to sex, love, or relationships of any kind. I ask that my guests choose a story they feel deeply compelled to tell me, and trust that it will be the right one, a narrative that others need to hear. I've had stories of myriad types and tones, stories about the first time ejaculating, episode two, Stuff Came Out, about friendship and suicide, episode 15, friend death, about having a relationship with a couple, episode 10, his fingers are always hard, about a big freaky wedding, episode 49, body storytelling, etc. As I said, all kinds. My live event, Horizontal Storytelling, is just these stories told back to back by six different pajama-clad, reclining storytellers. And on this coming Sunday, June 30th, two days from the release of this episode, I'm hosting another one. This time it will be the Horizontal Storytelling Pajama Party Summer Pride Edition. And all tales told will be from the lips of LGBTQPIAD storytellers. LGBTQPIAD stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, Pansexual, Intersex, Asexual, and demisexual. If you're unfamiliar with any of those terms, check the glossary on horizontalwithlila.com. And while you're there, sign up for the mailing list so that you'll know about all the events. This weekend's horizontal storytelling will include tales from folks across the gender and sexuality rainbow. And tickets are sliding scale for anybody in the community. Just message me for a personalized discount code. If you are an ally, use the code LILALOVE in all caps, for $5 off. So, I am broadcasting this quickie episode in honor of Sunday's upcoming event. This is one of the never-before-released tales from the last horizontal storytelling, held in February 2018. In this quickie, I lie down with Bill Demerit. Bill is a thespian, which means that he spends a large portion of his life pretending to be someone else. Most of the people who do that exceptionally are gifted with a formidable sense of compassion, and I believe that Bill is no different in that regard. He performs on stage and screen. You can see him in the Emmy-winning The Normal Heart in season two of the acclaimed Vimeo series, The Outs. He narrates audiobooks and long-form journalism. He studied acting at Marymount Manhattan and the Yale School of Drama. He's currently at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival working on Paula Vogel's play, Indecent. Bill is charming and game and playful and handsome and nebbishy and a little bit nervous all at the same time. You can find all things Bill on williamdemerit.com. But let me spell that for you because even I did not know how many M's and how many T's there were. William D-E-M-E-R-I-T-T Dot com. I first met Bill while doing a live recording of Carol A. Jansen's Help, a podcast for those who need it, in which an agoraphobic character with self-help aspirations begins to get out in the world. In season two, episode one, Lila Donalo and the Double Date, Carol and I, Bill and Celeste, 
go on a fictional double date in a very real Chinese food restaurant. Bill was cast as my date, and on the day we recorded, he brought me a dozen roses. That's how committed he was to the scene. I somehow ended up with 11, and they sort of turned out to be a consolation prize, but it's fine. He's getting married in November. After pulling off one of the most theatrical stage proposals I have ever seen captured on video. Congratulations, Bill. And thank you for showing me how it's done. In our quickie, Bill tells me a story about pierogies in New York. A calipagus behind. Going to Poland for sex and love. Kochania, the word for sweetheart. A romantic trip to Nice on September 11th. And now, join us on Sunday for the next Horizontal Storytelling. And come lie down with us at Hacienda Studio in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Bill, <laughs> you come lie down with me? I was wondering what my intro was going to do. <laughs> it's so rare that it seems like a muggle, but I'm like, totally not interesting compared to all the people you have. Oh, no. Hey, nice Hi. To um, nice to be horizontal with you. Yeah, this is a new experience. So what do we do? We just start? Well, will you tell me a story? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the point, right? Yeah. You asked me for the name of the story. Mm-hmm. And I told you it was, you don't have to go to Poland for this one. Yes. Which actually became a thing that my friends would say to me in if I was reaching too much for something after this happened, be like, Bill, you don't have to you don't have to go to Poland for this one. So ah. like many people of my approximate age, John Cusack has ruined a lot of things. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I love him. I don't know him, but I enjoy his films, but I think that he's and and the John Hughes and all that and the Molly Ringwald has sort of skewed perception of what love and romance should be. It's the second time it's come up this evening. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm going to be treading some territory that has been trod before. I was a late bloomer, and I, I think I'm still a late bloomer. Things are blooming <laughs> slowly. I'm, I'm a, there's, a, there's a little boy in this grown-up suit doing a very bad impression of a grown-up. Mm. And I didn't I was about to say I didn't date much in high school, but that would actually be a lie. I didn't date in high school. Not because I was saving myself. I think other people were saving me from them. <laughs> and, and or I was saving themselves from me. I, I don't know. So so I'm I, I finished college and I've lived in New York City my whole life, as you as you said. And somehow I found myself not at Veselka. You all know Veselka on the Lower East Side. Of course. Of course. And if you don't, just leave. But there was a place. <laughs> There was a place next door to Veselka, right next to the theater where Stomp is playing, mm-hmm. called The Stage Delicatessen. And I had become a big fan of pierogies from all my days at Veselka, but for some reason one day I went into The Stage, and it has closed in just the last few years. It was very sad. But it was this tiny, just railroad counter with maybe 12 stools, and that was the whole restaurant. And it was run by this guy named Andre, who was uh, Polish. And his niece, I learned his niece, was Agnieszka. And Agnieszka worked behind the counter at mm-hmm. the stage. Mm-hmm. And I started going there for pierogies literally multiple times a week. I would just take the 2nd Avenue bus down and I'd, I'd just... She was this Eastern European goddess. I was just told she had these light eyes and she had braces and like dark hair. <laughs> and, and she and she was just beautiful. And how old was she? She was at the time she was twenty six and I was twenty four, something like okay. that. So she wasn't she was an older woman, but only technically. And and we started this really intense courtship literally over the counter because her uncle as i learned was really overprotective and she was fresh off the boat and just living basically above the restaurant and was only allowed out to go to work and go to school and that was it so 
I was there all the time and I learned little Polish things. I had a friend, Anna, who I met in college and she spoke Polish and I would ask her, okay, I need, I need to break the ice. Like, what, what? And the first thing she taught me to say was, Shemam tosh vizembach, which means, do I have something in my teeth? Good friend. So I'm at the counter one day and, and I say, Agnieszka, Shemam tosh vizembach. And she goes, William, where do you learn? Like, ah. She called me, we, 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 you know. And so this went on and, and I would bring my buddies down there to show off this girl who I was totally enamored of and for the pierogies because they were just fucking the delicious. They were absolutely the best. Can I say fucking whatever I said? Yes. So I was there one day with, with my boys, Jason and Rob. And we used to call Rob Big Rob because, well, he's big. And I'll never forget it because <laughs> they ordered the pierogies and they were chowing the pierogies and they're like, damn, Bill, this shit is good. And then... Agnieszka turned around and bent over to get something and Rob choked on his pierogi. <laughs> because she, in the olden days, we would say Agnieszka was kalipagis, but in, do you know that word? No. Oh, it, it means having a well-formed behind. Uh, but in, in Polish, we would say she had a duża dupa. Uh, and, duża dupa? And, and Rob, you know, Rob's my Puerto Rican DJ friend, so like, he knows what he likes, you know what I mean? So, and then after she came up, I asked for the salt and she put the salt down on the table in a way where she could brush across my hand and give me mm -hmm. the salt. And Rob was like, <laughs> so, so this went on for way too, literally months probably. And I was able to get her out a handful of times for dates with very strict curfews and she couldn't tell her family. And so it was all very furtive. And then this was back in 2000. So email was not what it is now. If, if you kids can Wayne's world it back to that time. <laughs> so I would, I had a hotmail account. You know, I was, oh. I was so, I was so fly with my hotmail. And I would have to go to my mom's office to email because I didn't because we didn't have a computer. What? To read, you had to go to your mom's office to read the hotmail. To to email, yeah, we didn't to have a email. computer, so yeah, man. Right? <laughs> Yo, I grew up in uh, yeah, it's times were hard. So <laughs> so so at this point now, I think this courtship had started in the winter, and it was now coming on on April and Easter and spring. And Agnieszka told me that she was going back to Poland for Easter. And she said, hopefully I will be able to come back. And I got this in an email, hopefully I will come back. And I, I hopefully, what, hopefully, what, hopefully. And she said, well, it's Poland, so things happen. So, oh. so sure enough, I get an email a few weeks later, they revoked her visa oh. when she got back to Poland. And and I was, at this point, I was completely in love with this woman. Completely head over heels, bonkers. So I said, I'm coming to Poland. And, yeah, oh. black Jewish kid from the Bronx. Oh, no. <laughs> and, Can it come over to the and much as John Cusack and our lovely Grant, was it Grant, lovely British Grant. gentleman? He alluded to the big gesture. So I think this is where... I became the king of the big gesture. And I have learned hindsight's a motherfucker, isn't it? Retrospect. Mm -hmm. Big gesture is easy. It's the daily investment, which is really where the love is shown, right? Which I have very happily learned, thank you, with my current partner, where it's just a gift to do that every day. But we're not talking about her. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to Poland and I call up my uncle <laughs> who's the one guy in the family with money and he flies all the time. I'm like, hey, do you have any miles? Cause, cause I need to go to Poland. And he's like, mm. <laughs> um, you know, if he was black, he would have said Negro, please, but he's Jewish, so he didn't. And he, he gave me the miles and I booked a flight, I guess a month or so later to, to go to Poland. And I'm paranoid because, as I mentioned, I'm a New Yorker and I'm Jewish, so I have a lot of 
fears, and I'm an actor, so I have a lot of neuroses. <laughs> but I had noticed the tenor of our emails were changing, and the declarations of love on her end were less effusive. But, you know, it's email. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to tell sometimes, and English is not her first language, and honestly, it was, it was getting worse you know, the more she was away from, from America. Because she wasn't in Warsaw, even. She wasn't in Krakow. She was in a, a little town called Slupsk, which is by the Baltic Sea. So, Slupsk. 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 So, but I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to Poland. And all my friends are like, what? <laughs> going to Warsaw? No. I'm not. You, and then one of my friends said, oh, well, you're going to go to the Holocaust Museum. I said, that's not what this trip is about. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I, I will go to Auschwitz at some point. This is not that trip. <laughs> All due respect. So, so I land in in the air uh, the airport in Warsaw because Sloops doesn't have, have an right because it's you know it's I, I can't even think of what town would be the equivalent in America, but yeah, it's Bumblefuck Poland basically is Bumblefopski Poland. Um, no. So. So I had heard about a friend of hers. I want to say her name was Daniela. It's been several years, so let's just pretend her name was Daniela. And I'd heard about this person a lot. And I see a woman holding a sign that says, William, but it's not Agnieszka. And she says, I'm Daniela. I'm Agnieszka's friend. I was like, it's great to meet you. We're the f <laughs> like, like I flew halfway across the world. And Agnieszka kind of came out behind and was like, hi, William, you know. And so it was, so then we had to drive all night to get to her, her town. And Daniela was driving and Agnieszka was in the passenger seat. And it was the first time in my life I had felt illiterate. Because when you're in a romance language country, you can kind of figure some stuff out. And German, a lot of their words are kind of like, but Polish, I mean, the Slavic languages. I, so I didn't, I didn't understand any of the signs we were passing. And we stopped in these weird roadside, I mean, just imagine the most Eastern European roadside diner. I, it's not even a diner. Sausage. Oh, yeah. But I just meant decor-wise, just like oh. wood and dark, you know. And yes, and there's a lot of sausage and fried things. Now, I was, I, I, I'm not going to say I was learning Polish, but I tried to learn helpful world, words. And one of the words that I used was, uh, what I learned was kochanie, which means sweetheart. And the important thing is that the Polish, well, the Poles don't use colloquialisms the way we do. It's very common to call someone hun, sweetie, darling, babe, whatever, if they're not your partner. But in Poland, you only use kochanie for your kochanie, for your sweetheart. You would never call anyone else kochanie. And at one point, I had asked Agnieszka, how do you say, how are you? And she said, well, we don't really say that. Because here, people say that, and they don't mean it. They're just like, hey, how are you? I went to the store, blah, blah, blah. But in Poland, if you ask someone how you are, it act they actually, hey, how are you? So they don't really use it. So this is all to say that I'm in the car in this night-long drive with Daniela and Agnieszka. And... I didn't have a cell phone because it was 2000 and I was like, eh, cell phones are bullshit, whatever. <laughs> um, and Agnieszka picks up the phone and she's saying, having a conversation in Polish, and then she, I hear the word kochanie. Don't go to the end. <laughs> Don't go to the end. <laughs> and I thought, well, either she's talking about me or she's not. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if it wasn't clear from the implications of our furtive courtship, we had not consummated our relationship to this point mm. because that would have been really difficult unless we found a phone booth and that would have, you know, been not the way to do it. So, and let's face it, I, th my game was not at that level to, <laughs> to make street sex happen at that point. And I wouldn't have wanted to because I was like totally in love with her. So we get to her home and it's this beautiful little apartment in... The, I, I mean, any photo you've seen, if it's like the big sort of project looking austere with the courtyard and it just looks very, dun, dun, you know, very Eastern European. Hey man, look, it looks very Cold War. It looks very, very frighteningly Cold War, but her apartment's adorable and I'm amazed by 
the efficacy, like the efficiency of all the appliances, the washing machine. I'm in the Bronx, you know, I have a big fucking clunking thing. And then she shows me to my room. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I was thinking, oh, maybe, you know, we're, we're going to take our, because I was going to be in Poland for, I think I'd planned to be there for like a month, three weeks or something like that. Wow. Yeah, wow. So I was like, okay, well, I guess, you know, we're warming up. And we would, and the it, warm up was, was more than a couple days. And we would go out and we would do things and we'd see her friends and I would kind of wait for everyone to translate stuff. And I was really enjoying myself, but I also felt a little bit like a pet because I, I didn't know enough of the language and we were not in a major city where there was anything to fucking do. And then one day she sat me down when we were home and she explained to me mm. that after she sort of, I mean, basically got deported in a way that she had met someone mm. and she had a date with him. And would I wait here in the house? Oh. And I mean, the answer was yes, because what, I mean, I have nowhere to go. And even at the time, it definitely dawned on me later. I, I understood. She didn't think she was coming back. And, you know, her American, not even boyfriend, her American suitor was pledging to come to Poland. But she didn't know me. Like, I fucking went, like, I, I say I'm going to go to Poland. I'm going to go to Poland. <laughs> but so she met this guy because she was trying to restart her life, thinking she wouldn't, you know, once they revoke your visa, you're not coming back for a while. So she went on this date with this, whoever the fucking this Polish guy was, and and I stayed in the house, and I looked at the courtyard and like kids playing soccer, and I I I guess I had brought CDs with me. I guess I brought CD yes CDs kids CDs it was two thousand mm. and I remember God <laughs> parachutes the first Coldplay album had just come out. Uh huh. Which was a good album. It was good. It was good. They they sucked once he got married. Like most artists, once they get happy, they suck. But uh, and I was just like blasting Coldplay, and then I started blasting really aggressive rap music and like trying to get the opinion, the attention of the fucking Polish people in the courtyard, and just I was so angry. I was so and I had nothing to do with this anger, and I really felt like a pet right now. And I called my mom uh, from Poland. And I called my friend, one of my best friends in the world, uh, my friend Estelle, who I know from college, who often has, as she would say, come to Jesus chats with me. And she's like, you need to get out of there. I'm like, where the fuck do I go? And my mom made some calls and she had a coworker from France who I'd met a few times named Agnes. And my mom said, Agnes has arranged for you to stay with her family in Nice. Nice, so France? Just, yeah, Nice, France. Which, if, if we all don't have the geography off the top of our head, Poland, Germany, France, right? Which, at that time, I barely had that geography in my head. So she, like, she said, just find your way, find your way to Nice. Um, uh -huh. so, so Agnieszka came back, and I, at some point, told her, hey, I, I love you, but this, this, is, this is killing me. This is not... Great. So I guess we had another day or two in Poland. And in that day or two, she opened up. And I think, yeah, that's where we had sex for the first time. And actually where I had sex for the first time, I lost my virginity in Poland. Um, oh. I had to go all the way to Poland. No. <laughs> um, and, but it... it there was a little yay in there. What? I heard a little yay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I, it was it was a big yay actually. It was a very very yay moment. <laughs> and and she was really starting to come around and open up and and the love was coming back. But I had made plans. So she and and Daniela drove me back to Warsaw a couple of days later so I could get the bus to Paris to get to Nice. And at the bus stop we had this very teary goodbye and she's like William I'm so sorry I love you and I will I will come to I will come to friends I will come to friends and we will be together and blah 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 
And I was like, all right, but I'm getting on this bus now. And what about all that other stuff? And I believe you, but I don't. I'm sure I didn't actually say all of that. And I got on a bus and I'm 6'3". And it takes a day, literally 24 hours, to get from, from Warsaw to Paris by bus. And it was not comfortable. And I made a, a friend this, I guess he was probably like 12 or something, this little Polish boy sitting in front of me on the bus, could not believe that I was from New York. <laughs> and he was so excited and we were pen pals for a little while. But then, Aww. thanks. Uh, this is before uh, Poland was in the EU. As I mentioned, I'm Jewish. And I'd never been to Germany. And we get to the German border and there's a huge wall and barbed wire and all these young people with very large uh, guns. And they order us off the bus to inspect the bus. And they're being very German about everything. And, and I'm, free, I'm freaking out. Also, I didn't know I wasn't allowed to take certain things across the border. And I had this bottle of Polish gin that I really liked. I don't remember what it's called now. And I, I was thinking, oh God, I heard I'm not supposed to have this gin. Someone just told me in the bus I'm not supposed to have this gin. And what if they look through the bag and the gin? And again, long bus ride. So I'd taken my shoes off. And I was not going to take the time to put my shoes. Germans with guns tell me to get off the bus. I get off the bus. I've seen the movie. You know, I'm just going to get off the bus. And so they start searching people's bags randomly. And they've, li they've lined us all up. They've lined us all up. And, and they look at me. And I remember it's this very attractive, terrifying looking German woman and this taller German guy. <laughs> and, they have, and they have their large, I don't know what they were, their large German guns. And they, they, using their guns, point down at my feet and they go, nine Schusse? You know, and, and I, I said, uh, an autobus, autobus, the shoes. And they're going, ha ha, nine Schusse. And they laugh with each other that I don't have shoes. And, <laughs> yeah, fun times in Eastern Europe. But they didn't look in my bag. So, hey, so I got back on the, got a distraction. That was it. It was just, hey, yeah. So, <laughs> So I, I get back on the bus and I continue on to Paris and Paris, you know, and France in the EU. So I'm, that hadn't clicked yet. So I'm thinking, fuck, we're going to get to the fucking French border and have to go through all this shit again. But maybe they'll be French. So they'll just be like, oh, where's your cigarettes and did they do and come have sex in the corner. But, but there was, there was no, there was no anything. It was just a flag and just drive right through. So way to go. So get to Paris take the bullet train down to Nice and I stay with Agnes's family and they're so lovely and they were so impressed because they were they were cooking steak and they go oh well you you want it well done you are American and I said no I'm in France I want I want a rare steak and, oh such a good American you will have wine <laughs> yeah oh he's such a good American he has wine he has a rare steak and, it was, and they <laughs> <laughs> and and for lunch every day they'd have like fresh melon and prosciutto and like all this fresh meat and wine and all this cheese. I was like, what what have I been doing with my life? Because clearly <laughs> my life is in Nice. And then <laughs> I hear from Agnieszka William, I'm coming to Nice. What? What? Right. So I get us a hotel room because we couldn't stay with Agnes's family because they didn't know her and they weren't comfortable with that so I had to respect that I was probably a little bit of a dick about it because I have a code that if I'm cool with you and you have someone and you're cool with them then they must be cool but they weren't like that so that's cool so I said cool way too many fucking times so I uh, so Agnieszka and I got a hotel room and she showed up in Nice and we had this amazing just love-filled romantic time in the south of France and then I guess Agnes's cousin and her boyfriend they drove us to Monaco and Monte Carlo not like I could afford to do any of the shit there but I looked at it and it was like Disneyland <laughs> made of marble it was great and then Agnieszka had to go home and I had to fly back to America I said we're gonna get engaged and I'm gonna get you a visa and you're gonna come back and she said, let's do that. So I got back to the States and I guess it was August, maybe July. And I started going down to the fucking whatever government 
building that is down by City Hall where you, you do that shit, the federal building, I was filling out all this paperwork and it was just endless lines and endless paperwork and I would talk to her on the phone and, and she was positive, but it was tough. And then September 11th happened. So things got a lot tougher. And the reality of everything started to set in between the two of us. And I remember I called her up on Halloween 2001. And I said, I don't, I don't think I can marry you. And she's like, I, I am, she basically said, I'm sad, but I understand. So I try not to go to Poland anymore, metaphorically. <sighs> My intro music was created by Alan Markley, who is on Instagram as Plastic Cannons. And my saucy little minx of a logo was designed and illustrated by Shauna Shea, whom you can seek out on 99designs. To become a patron of the Horizontal Arts, visit patreon.com slash horizontalwithlila. For extremely intermittent emails with sensual photos, interviews, blogs, and happenings, sign up on HorizontalWithLila.com. Until next time, may you have someone to love, or someones to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. I'm looking forward to the Horizontal Storytelling Pajama Party on Sunday, June 30th, of course. Come lie down with us, in person, in Bushwick. Check the website or my Instagram bio for details. Big love to you. And as always, as ever, thank you for lending me your ears. Thank you for that story. Very few people have had that heard the whole truth. Well, now a whole room full of yeah, people have yeah, heard the whole thing. <laughs> oh, internet You're a great story.